they say Twitter isn't real life, but I think there's, there's no other conference where so many people that I've met on Twitter I've actually met in real life. So, um, in any case, my talk is titled In Defense of Particularistic Nationalism, or we could call it In Defense of National Particularism. Um, I, I believe the challenge that we face as national conservatives is not actually globalism. I actually think EU, Davos, UN could disappear and our challenge would remain. Because actually the problem, in my view, is much more about cultural distinctiveness than it is about political sovereignty. I'm far more concerned about this loss of Western countries' cultural distinctiveness and their ties to previous generations. These are challenges that are coming from within and not from without. The American sociologist Talcott Parsons distinguished between what he called universal and traditional orientations. The universal uh, modern orientation based on achievement and universalism and the traditional orientation based on particularism and ascription. Now, it's a much too crude distinction. Actually, we need both. That accords best with our human nature. Um, but still, this is a useful distinction for thinking about the types of national identity. National identity isn't a monolithic thing. There are different versions of national identity that are always in competition. And what we have is a sort of achieved universalist modern version of national identity and an ascribed particularistic version of national identity rooted in particular myths, collective memories, and symbols. These are the two competing versions of national identity. However, in recent decades, Britain's political elite has been relentlessly universalistic in its view of the nation. And that includes those who led the official Brexit campaign. On the left, we find a universalist nationalism that emphasizes moral perfection. We call it a woke moral perfection. While on the right, we have the Conservative Party emphasizing a kind of GDP nationalism based on economic growth. I'm not against moral improvement or economic growth. These are important things. But whenever they have conflicted with the protection of British distinctiveness, that particularism has gone under the bus and that has resulted in rapid cultural change and considerable popular unease, which, as Matt has mentioned, was expressed repeatedly, for example, in the Brexit vote. And so what this underscores, I would argue, in, for national conservatives is less of a focus on economics, universal ideals, or even political sovereignty, and much more focus on protecting, developing, and celebrating national distinctiveness in the culture. Now, this isn't about preserving things in aspect, but it is about rebalancing from the relentless universalism that has characterized previous decades, not just in Britain, uh, but in uh, North America as well. So the progressive left's universalistic nationhood is a moralistic perfectionism. It's based on the currency of victimhood and privilege. We heard about this from a number of speakers yesterday. Um, woke nationalism is not an oxymoron. My, the prime minister of my country uh, Pierre, oh, sorry, Justin Trudeau. Uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, I, I could actually swap in Pierre as well because they're very similar in many ways. But So Trudeau wears rainbow socks. He says people kind instead of mankind. He lowers the national flag to half-mast for months on the, in response to the complete hoax of the indigenous mass graves. He's signaling to the world that Canada is... is first among equals when it comes to woke moralism. That is actually a form of nationalism based on universal moral perfection. Now on the right, we have also got a universalistic nationalism. If we take the American case, from Bush Sr. to Romney, we had a fusion of three universal missionary forms of nationalism. The low-tax economic libertarianism, the neocon militarist democracy promotion, and evangelical Christian moralism. These three things, outward-facing, universalistic. Lost in all this, again, is conserving and protecting and developing national particularism. And in Britain, likewise, as we've heard from Matt, the emphasis on global free trade, that is really what's sacred to the heart of many conservative MPs. Cultural conservatism is a poor cousin, at best a very secondary concern. And I think this explains why we've seen immigration at record levels in not only in the Blair years, but certainly under Cameron and later under Johnson and Truss. The Brexit campaign, in which a small group of liberal Brexiteers hijacked the vote to claim that leavers really wanted out of the EU so that they could be more open to the world, more global. While some Leave voters may have told reporters this, if you look at large-scale data, as, as I do, it's very clear that the 
best predictors of a, of, a, of a leave vote is the desire for lower immigration levels. And if you unpick lower immigration levels, that correlates very strongly with cultural statements such as British culture was better in the past, for example. Most leave voters, or many of them, view the rapid changes that have taken place in re recent decades as a form of loss and no longer recognize the country that they see on television or in the city streets. None of this is racist, by the way, as I'll explain in a minute. So where Brexit voters wanted a more culturally secure Britain, Brexit elites wanted, like Bro Boris Johnson, wanted a global Britain. In response to the business lobby and his pro-immigration cabinet, Johnson relaxed the rules on entry, issued a million visas in 2021. He was followed by Liz Truss, who was so desperate for a trade deal with India, she was willing to entertain selective free movement with a country of 1.4 billion people. MPs' surveys that are more systematic show consistently that Tory MPs are well to the left of their constituents, that is, of their Tory voters, 2019 voters. They're far to the left on cultural issues. And this is a pattern we see across Europe. There's research that shows this as well, that conservative MPs and politicians are well to the left of their voters on culture and to the right of them on economics. Business liberalism, not conservatism, is what gets conservative MPs up in the morning for the most part. Um, and, and so what we see with this tension between universalism and particularism is something similar to what we've seen on the right in the 19th century in Britain between Little Englanders and imperialists. The imperialists being more the universalists, the Little Englanders being more the particularists. Now, a lot of Ling Little Englanders were liberal anti-imperialists, but there were also conservative nationalists among them like G.K. Chesterton, who opposed the Boer War and who wrote in 1904, uh, a healthy man does not demand cosmopolitanism, does not demand empire, he demands nationalism. Um, something similar in the U.S. after the Mexican-American War and the Spanish-American uh, War, where um, essentially the imperialists were arguing for annexing Mexico, for annexing the Philippines, and the national conservative particulars were opposed to annexing these new territories because that would weaken the social cohesion of the United States. People like William Jennings Bryan. So the, re the reality is most people are attached to the nation primarily through particular characteristics, cultural characteristics. Distinguishing features of nationhood, such as history, landscape, cuisine, sports, and yes, ethno-religious composition. We have to have that discussion. This is not a racist or an exclusionary concept. Calls for protecting national particularism are instantly greeted with cries, with alarmist hysteria, and the slippery slope fallacy propounded by the progressive commentariat. But this doesn't actually reflect the relative danger of universalism and particularism. Systematic quantitative studies of genocide risk uh, of countries show that universalist extremism is as or more dangerous for genocide than particularist extremism. So for every Rwanda, there's a Cambodia, for every Hitler, a Stalin. And yet, we don't seem to be able to grasp this. We're always pro-universalist, anti-particularist. These things have to be balanced. Whether, whether out of ignorance or bad faith, progressives are fond of committing the fallacy of composition, collapsing discussions about national level cultural protection into questions about individual level membership and belonging. It's a bit like saying criticizing the National Health Service is like criticizing nurses. No, you can criticize at the collective level, the NHS, without criticizing nurses. They're two separate levels. Let's look at this fallacy of composition with regard to accent. At one level, all British accents are, uh, sorry, all accents are British accents. You can have any accent and you should be treated as an equal British person. But on the other hand, the idea that uh, a British accent is not different from a French, French accent is utterly absurd. Again, that's the difference between individual membership criteria, all accents are equally British, and at the collective national level, no, the British accent is distinct from other accents. And so we can imagine an, an immigrant with an Indian accent being attached to the British accent as a feature of their adopted homeland, which they are celebrating. So again, this distinction between the nation and the individual progressives will always seek to collapse any discussion about cultural conservation into a question about exclusion and membership. And we can hold this, the same thing holds for more contentious debates around ethnicity and religion. 
Surveys show, for example, that British Sikhs view stereotypically English physical traits like pale skin and red or blonde hair as part of their Britishness that they are attached to. How can that be the case? Again, this doesn't mean British Sikhs think, think that br brown-haired people are second-class Brits. It's about the distinction between distinguishing features at the national level and individual membership criteria. They're not the same thing. Hispanic and Asian Trump voters are as likely as white Trump voters to say it's important to preserve and protect the country's European heritage. How can this be? Again, it's the same paradox. You can't collapse national distinctiveness into a question about membership criteria. Reducing immigration to slow down the rate of ethnic change, therefore is not stop it, but to slow it down is something that conservative nationalists of all races support. National conservatives need to begin thinking about these questions of diversity and solidarity. The idea that endless diversity is always a good thing. No, it's not. There's an optimal level of diversity in society. Diversity increases through immigration. It declines through assimilation. Uh, there's plenty of room for those who don't want to assimilate. This shouldn't be a pressured thing. Um, that's fine. We, we're going to have ethnic diversity. But at the same time, a preponderant ethnic majority helps to anchor a national identity and prevent politics from running along ethnic lines as it does in deeply diverse societies such as Guyana or Kenya. The public record shows, by the way, as well, that um, if you want to do high, that, that some people argue we can do high immigration, we just have to do integration. Um, I would challenge anyone in this room to name me a successful policy for reducing residential segregation in any free society where people are free to move where they wish to move. There is no such example. And this is why it is key to regulate the pace of immigration. That is the only lever that we can control. Integration and immigration will tend to happen organically. So immigration, uh, sorry, integration and assimilation. And so therefore it is vital to um, regulate the pace of immigration. Also, uh, we heard about traditions. Catherine Burblesing uh, mentioned education. I want you to imagine a thought experiment in which every Union Jack in the country was replaced by a Chinese flag or some other flag. It doesn't really matter. You can say that, well, look, as long as people's standard of living, the cost of living, uh, NHS waiting lists, uh, inflation, as long as those things aren't affected, hey, who, who cares? These are just culture wars. But actually, the tissue of symbol and memory which binds people together, which is represented by that flag, is very important, links them to past generations. And what's happening in the school system here, as in other parts of the world, Canada is perhaps the worst, the US as well, but it's also happening here in a, in a report for policy exchange, I found that three in four British school children had heard radical race and gender concepts such as white privilege and systemic racism in their schools. Few have any understanding that slavery, genocide, and conquest were universal in non-Western societies, not inventions of white Brits. They know nothing about utopian leftist excesses such as the Khmer Rouge genocide or Stalinist, um, the Stalinist genocides in Russia. Is it any wonder that 60% of 18 to 25 year olds in this country say Britain is a racist country? And just 21% have a positive view of Winston Churchill. These are tomorrow's voters. They've been reared in Britain's education system and the conservatives have allowed this to occur under their watch and even when they have acted late in the game on something like school indoctrination, their guidance, they've run shy of the educational establishment, issuing flabby guidance with weak enforcement provisions and thus failing to stop this cultural revolution. There is simply no British leader with the courage and policy follow through shown by politicians in the US such as Ron DeSantis. At bottom, the problem is that most British Tories are universalist nationalists, they don't care about these cultural issues. They're happy to play in the sandbox that the progressive establishment will allow them to play in called economics because that means they're not going to be called racist. When the BBC and the Labour Party say don't stoke the culture war, these useful idiots nod along, allowing the woke left to steamroll its way through the institutions with no resistance. So, just to finish, for national conservatism to succeed in Britain, Tory MPs must either be converted to the cause of protecting and developing the culture, or they must be selected out. The salience... <laughs> the, 
Uh, central government, so the salience of cultural issues needs to be raised the way the salience of the European Union issue was raised. And central government is going to have to re reassert control over public bodies, compelling them to be politically neutral or balanced while making an example of activists that insist repeatedly on injecting woke politics into them. The hour is late. We have at most a decade or two to turn back this cultural revolution in our schools and in our institutions that is remaking the minds of young people and cutting them off from the bonds that have held the country together for centuries.